connect and share our work with you. I'm Amna Siddiqui, the producer and moderator of this program. Today we're discussing facets of DIY tinkering for students, otherwise known as physical computing, where kids are empowered to make things by mixing and matching and hacking digital and analog pieces like batteries and fabric, computer languages, and paper. We'll also be sharing how you can make physical computing accessible to young people, and where to find free resources to begin setting up your own DIY tinkering studio. Now, let's meet our speakers. We're joined by five fantastic experts, four of which are professionals, and one is a student at New York City's public school, Quest to Learn, and she's a member of the physical computing after school program, Short Circuit. But we'll hear more about Short Circuit in a bit. Um, so let's first uh, briefly introduce ourselves. Don, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'm Don Miller. I work as a learning designer at the Institute of Play. I do a lot of work um, in uh, after school, but also um, formal education here with the teachers and working with game designers. And uh, last year I taught short circuit and um, I also helped to write the curriculum and the professional development materials for short circuit that are online that we'll be talking about a little later. Great. And Ariana, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Ariana Phillips, and I am the one non-professional at Quest to Learn, and I'm the student. So yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> great. I don't really know it. <laughs> ben. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Leduc Mills. I work uh, as a doctoral student in the um, Craft Technology Lab at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, where we kind of work on the intersection of computational and craft materials, um, which specifically ties into how we can get kids interested in kind of computational thinking. Uh, and I also work at SparkFun Electronics uh, as an education outreach coordinator. Um, and at SparkFun, we do a whole bunch of different uh, kind of outreach activities, but uh, we'll get into those a little bit later, and uh, hopefully we can share some of those with you. Thanks, Ben. And Kylie? Hi, I'm Kylie Pepler. I am an assistant professor at Indiana University, and I, I run a group called the Creativity Labs, and we've been investigating uh, physical computing in the context of e-textiles work here, and um, have been working uh, with the Institute of Play to sort of develop uh, uh, materials at the juncture of uh, schools and after-school programs um, around e-textile materials. Thanks, Kylie. And Syed? Hey, so, uh, here you go. Um, uh, I am a co-founder of Baby Castles, and um, I teach at the Courant Institute of Math and Sciences at NYU, uh, as well as um, NYU Polytechnic. And um, I'm currently the instructor of uh, Short Circuit at Quest to Learn. Great, and Tony? Hello, I'm Tony Pizza. I am currently an MFA student at NYU's Game Center. Uh, so I'm getting a master's degree in game design, and I am Syed's assistant for Short Circuit. Awesome. That's, that's as exciting as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everyone. And I want to remind our viewers that at, if, it, if at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, just click on the blue participate text under this video on the right-hand side. We'll be spending the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar answering your questions during our Q&A portion. So let's begin today's discussion talking about some of you guys' your, your own educational initiatives around physical computing in, in some greater detail. Um, I specifically want to talk about short, skirt, short circuit, spark fun, and baby castles. So Ben, do you wanna do you wanna start and, and give us an overview of SparkFun and, and tell us who it's for and, and what SparkFun is setting out to do? Yeah, sure. So SparkFun has been around as an electronics company for about 10 years, but uh, we've only had an official department of education for about two. Uh, and in those two years, we've uh, done a bunch of things. We've launched a website. Um, that has a bunch of curriculum and tutorials and resources for teachers and educators uh, at learn.sparkfun.com. And we've also started doing tours. So uh, last fall we went to the West Coast and um, in the winter we went to the East Coast. Um, we went to schools and hacker spaces and all sorts of um, different kind of uh, tech education spots and um, kind of brought them some spark fun love and, and, and tried to reach out to them on a grassroots level. 
Um, we also work with libraries and um, trying to get actual kind of DIY kits into libraries, uh, which I think is a, a really important part of how this is going to work in the future. Um, so really we tackle everything from like teaching four-year-olds how to solder to teaching retired engineers, um, you know, new tricks. So uh, it really runs the gamut, um, and we're, we're always constantly looking for new ideas and, and what um, people want to learn out there. So we try to be flexible, and, and uh, this summer and fall, we're going to be traveling all across the country in an RV, basically teaching anyone that wants to have us. So it'll be really fun. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, Syed, could you talk about baby castles and uh, maybe explain one of the, the recent workshops you, you did um, where kids made their own arcade, uh, arcade uh, toys? Yeah, um, so baby castles is basically this ongoing effort to create independent arcades um, in the city and around the world. And um, so, so we go around doing workshops um, uh, install, installing um, arcades in, in different venues. So the most recent one was in Savannah where um, a SCAD student um, basically uh, brought a game and we, we had a workshop where we, we basically took a, a piece of hardware, we installed some, some, some uh, scripting tools to, to turn it into like this automated arcade uh, game cabinet and um, the students who were at the workshop uh, broke open this mouse and soldered uh, a button to it to, so uh, to create this reset button that would start the computer and, and shut down the computer and load the game and um, there's some really cool pictures that I'll, I'll show later. So. Great, thanks. And Don, could you tell us about Short Circuit, the after-school program, which is um, at Quest, and I think that's where you and Ariana are right now. <laughs> yeah, we're at um, Quest right now, and yeah, Short Circuit is an after-school program, meets twice a week, mm -hmm. and um, for two hours a day after school, and primarily sixth, seventh grade students, but we've had eighth and ninth grade students in there as well. The majority of the work mm -hmm. we do is around physical computing, although there is a lot of um, kind of hacking, both software and mm -hmm. hardware, reverse engineering. Uh, Syed works a lot with hacking apart old mice to make new game controllers, and we've done um, other things similar in the past. Um, it, it, it is usually a series of projects the students work on, um, but uh, once a year we do get together and um, participate in Emoticon, which is a competition, um, NYC-based uh, um, educational organizations where the students would come in and bring and uh, bring the work they've done and show it off and display it. So um, it is largely informal, uh, but the students do have uh, a chance to uh, compete and show off what they've done once a year. And uh, Ariana, can you tell me what it's like to be in short circuit and to get to to get to tinker and, and hack and create things? Um, well, we sometimes use our Arduino. The last thing we did was make this really annoying but kind of cool thing that made noises, and it made the first seven songs of Neon Cat, right, Sad? Huh? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a sound output out of an Arduino, and we yeah. you would just uh, and select certain notes, and um, I had... Uh, the students go to a games um, uh, a games a guitar tab site and you'd pick a song and then uh, put the notes into the Arduino and it would it would make a uh, infinite loop of, of noise <laughs> awesome thanks guys and then Kylie I was wondering if you could talk about your own research sure. around e -text e textiles and, and student learning Sure. Yeah, we've you know we've had a lot of fun because eTextiles really puts a lot of stuff on its head um, that you normally you know for example like with alligator clips you're working with wires that are insulated.
insulated, and all of a sudden you switch to e-textiles. Instead of soldering connections, you're sewing them with uninsulated thread. Um, and so it causes you to create shorts, like in short circuits, right? And um, for us as learning scientists, what's really interesting about that experience is that um, it causes the kids to really think about the things they thought they knew about circuits and, and to reevaluate. And so our kids that have come into our workshops having some traditional experience with materials, all of a sudden the e-textiles work really pushes them further and really makes a lot of things transparent that um, were previously invisible about electronics. Uh, you know, and I think it's also really, really fun to kind of look at this merger um, and see this like aesthetic and beautiful side of what normally people would envision as robotics, which um, uh, doesn't necessarily have that the tie to craft and um, uh, women's materials like e-textiles does. Thank you. So let's get into what exactly physical computing is. Um, ben, I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us about uh, physical computing and how it encourages or, or facilitates creative expression. Wow, okay, that's a big question. Um, I think everyone on this panel is probably as equally uh, qualified to answer that as I am, but um, to me anyway, physical computing is kind of about getting at, um, it's actually getting at human expression through um, technology. So how can you get technology to sense your presence and react to it? Or um, how can you express your, your artistic or creative side through certain um, sensors or motors or, uh, you know, e-textiles, whatever. Um, and this is crucial, I think, to kind of teaching kids a lot of different skills. Um, there's, there's a whole kind of range of pedagogy that, that uh, touches on why making things with your hands is important for um, kind of cementing certain learning activities. Um, you know, embodied cognition, constructivism, um, all these things play into um, really getting kids engaged and, and kind of feeling like they're the author of, of what they create because there's actually a physical object that they created and they can take authorship of that and it really empowers them to be um, kind of interested and engaged in, in what happened to make um, their object come alive. So I think that's really important. Great. And could somebody, I, I guess you all can probably answer this, but um, talk more about the advantages of exposing young people to the practice of, of tinkering and, and hacking. I, I guess I, I can throw in some stuff right here. Um, so in Short Circuit, we do a lot of the tinkering, obviously. And it's so important, um, and I, I don't think I noticed it until I was in the classroom, um, not at Quest to Learn, but in my grad classes, and um, we're expected to constantly be like tinkering and playing with things, and there are so many of us who have sort of lost that touch, and so just going into the classroom every week uh, at Quest to Learn is just so inspiring because the kids are just constantly coming up with these new ideas that, you know, like my colleagues, you know, at the Game Center wouldn't have even thought of. And so it's great to, you know, sort of cement the importance of that now and just, like, let them experiment and have fun and play. And, Tony, what types of skills do you think kids are, are gaining or refining um, in short circuit? In short, okay. Well, I mean, they are learning the basics of, um, you know, physical computing stuff, but they're also learning a lot of, like, collaboration um, sometimes we'll have projects that are a little harder for one person to do on their own, so they'll work together, or um, if we have an odd number, like, I'll work with a student, and so it's really good to um, help with communication and sort of just get the students to um, share their ideas and sort of integrate, like, idea A and idea B into project C that sort of encompasses both ideas in a really unique way. Great. Thanks, Tony. And so maybe I'm stating the obvious here, but there seems to be a, a variety of ways to, to tinker with hardware within this, um, this niche. So, uh, for example, like Syed, your, your arcade building seems very different 
with, with <clears throat> um, Kylie's research around e-textiles. So I'm wondering if, if, um, if maybe you said you can talk about these different projects, which essentially do the same thing, but are able to, to fill different interests among students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, uh, I really like focusing on, on, on games when I'm doing physical computing, um, uh, because uh, recently there's been like this new space in independent games, like physical games, where you're taking you're taking different types of different modes of uh, of controls, like the PS3 Move controller or or the Kinect. You have different ways of interacting with games, and I, I really want to explore that space of of you know taking. Um, uh, objects that we use every day, like a keyboard or a mouse, and you know, breaking them apart, um, extending the circuits from a mouse, and then and then showing students that you can, you know, essentially make a button. A button doesn't have to be the size that it is; it can be as big as you want. And so, you know, it could be a button that takes up the entire room. Um, so we, what we try to do is we curate these. Um, we try to curate these games that uh, have really simple interfaces, like uh, are usually one-button games, and then we have students um, create one-button controllers for them. And we did that at the MoMA Teens program um, last year, and I kind of build off of that um, in Short Circuit as well. Does anybody want to add to that? Okay. Um, so Ariana, I, I have another question for you. And that is, what do you what do you do or, or learn in short circuit that you that you don't in school or well, or, or anywhere for that matter? Um, well, we don't exactly know how to make robots at school, and that's pretty cool because it rhymed. Um, because um, I actually have a video of it on my iPod, but um. We all made this robot that could move with a motor, and we put Legos on it, and it was pretty cool. And it rotated its spinny thing. It, it was so. I guess you don't know how to make advanced technology-ish things at school, but you can at short circuit. So uh -huh. nice. And and Don or or Tony or Sayed, what do you what do you think that says that that these kids? Uh, who, who are participating in the short circuit after school program, they have this new opportunity to in, engage in things that they, they couldn't in, in um, a normal classroom setting. Well, I was going to say that um, you know, Quest is a very different school than most other public schools where the students are um, playing uh, mm -hmm. games during the day, whether they're digital or analog games. They're often using technologies from tablets to computers. And uh, the one interesting thing is that although they're using these technologies all day long, there's not often a thought to how the technologies behind the games are actually working. So to play very short circuit, I think, is, is beneficial for students because it kind of gets past that black box approach and they can look inside and say, oh, well, this is how buttons work, right? Or, oh, this is how electronics work. So if they're playing um, you know, a game during the day where they're interacting with the computer that's making noise, if they go and they learn how to make uh, electronics make noise after school, they get a little better, deeper understanding of what's actually going on in the technology that they use every day, whether it's a smartphone or a computer or a tablet, and I think that's really important. And that comes from both physical computing, but also coding as well. So just understanding um, the basics of coding that they might get from Arduino, and we also use processing sometimes where they can learn these things as well. Yeah, that sounds great, Don. I think, um, I think, you know, what Ariana was saying about this tension of having uh, this after-school space and not not having it in school, I think is, is really, um, it's true. But I, I think what's, what's really cool about the after-school space and what I'd love to see preserved in this new kind of national argument about extending the school day is that it allows you to, to explore your passions, but it also allows you to do a project like that robot probably didn't take 45 minutes to build, right? You know, so during the school day, it'd be really hard to say everybody's going to do and create a robot. It might take you several weeks. Might need some extra time. You know, it needs to be in sort of a flexible space, uh, like what you're describing. And so I think that that's really the value of these after-school spaces is just to go deep into something. But then, you know, maybe you can bring that into the school day at some point. And there's a lot of models for that. But uh, having that that space is just so important, I think. Great. And, and can somebody talk about 
um, how you how you how you hook these children in in by I mean is it something is it magical? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean I think from what I've seen, and and one good way of teaching this is is not don't start with the really kind of abstract concepts. You know, show them something that works. Get them to build something that they think is really interesting that they're passionate about, and that will motivate them later to kind of dig into why that works and what the concepts are that made that thing work for them. Um, if you can wow them and get them hooked and, and think that it's, it's just something that they thought they would never be able to do, um, then it's really something kind of, you, you sparked something that they didn't think they could do. And so that really, like, I think motivates them to continue learning about what made that possible. Thanks, Ben. So yeah, it definitely seems like this this intersection between digital and tangible it it makes it makes learning easier and and magical and more enjoyable for for students. And um, Kylie, I have a, a quick question about sure. hacking and, and tinkering and and how it promotes artistic expression and and how maybe how well does it pr promote artistic expression? Um, is it is it similar to an art class? Do you think? I think so. I think actually the kinds of things that happen in hackerspaces, the kinds of things that happen um, in the short circuits uh, community um, are exactly the kinds of things that I'd love to see eventually in the art space. And I, I think it's kind of a tale that this work could be taken up in sort of STEM disciplines or it could be taken up by artists. And uh, you know, if you've been sort of reading The New Yorker, if you've been uh, kind of watching, there's all sorts of artists that have started to pull physical computing into their artwork. And, uh, you know, a lot of contemporary art critics would say that this is actually a crucial part of becoming the art scene today. And so, um, so it's not just important for artists, but I think it's also important for all children as they get involved in this work to feel invited in. Um, so you can imagine in sort of a, a traditional STEM class, you would learn how to computer program, you would learn a physical computing principle. Uh, you wouldn't fall in love with it in the same way that, that Ben was just describing earlier, or at least typically most students don't fall in love with it in that way, um, which has kind of plagued robotics for a long time. Um, uh, as we move into the art classroom, all of a sudden there is no wrong, right? There's funny things that kind of emerge. There's there's really um, crazy things that can be created, and it's really inviting for for kids to come to the table and say, "Hey, I, I've got this thing here um, that I'd love to showcase." It doesn't have to win a competition. It doesn't have to be uh, the most efficient use of material. Um, you know, all the design problematics that that kind of go into like an engineering or a computer science curriculum. You don't have to have the shortest code. It can actually artists actually create really crazy code that's it's completely inefficient from a computer you know programming standpoint, but it's beautiful in terms of its expression of capabilities. Um, we've certainly had some kids that um, when I took their work to an external panel of, of media artists, um, they weren't the best programmers, they weren't the coders and the hackers, but they um, they kind of found this way to sort of mix their media, draw some hand drawn things, and um, uh, pull in code for these expressionate purposes that I would love to see the arts education community take up. That's awesome. Thanks, Kylie. And uh, Ariana, I heard that you are an artist, and I'm wondering how, how you use Short Circuit as, as your own art class. Um, well, sometimes it's, it is possible to program something that can actually create art. Um, We've done that before. Um, <laughs> how, how, how have you done that? Um, well, with Syad I did it, but it wasn't in short circuit, but it was with Syad. So um, we kind of made a turtle having a seizure while it says stuff and then makes all these colors and art and stuff. It's kind of funny, and you can hear Dawn laughing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, the program we wrote um, was basically... Um, we were doing some Python, and, and it comes with a package called um, Turtle Graphics, which is based off of, I don't know if you all use this program called Logo um, back in the day, and you, you have a little turtle, and you um, give it an instruction to go forward or go backwards, and um, you can choose uh, the pen color of the turtle, and what we did is we um, <coughs> gave it a bunch of random um, instructions and uh, showed Ariana that you could you can generate random numbers and tell the turtle to do random things, and it would just make this um, uh, this crazy drawing. And so 
it was a fun it was a fun time that's awesome so I'd like to move on to a bigger question and that is how does someone begin to teach physical computing to young people so I'm wondering if Tony can you talk about what someone needs to know in order to teach it yeah sure what do okay so I kind of came into this with more of a games background than um, physical computing uh, but one, you have to like be ready to learn with the kids. Uh, sort of accept that you like they're going to come up with ideas that you didn't think of, no matter how you know how um, complex of an understanding you have of it. Um, uh, I would say, I guess, just sort of tinkering as well. Like most of the things that I know are honestly from just like Syed handing me like an Arduino and some stuff and being like, here, like go s practice soldering and you know, find some, make something cool with this, like, breadboard and these wires. Um, and it's sort of just, like, it's, it's really just playing with it. I mean, I'm sure that's just my experience. I know, like, Syed has more, like, formal experience, but I think that, you know, an informal uh, introduction can also work. Awesome. And Ben or Syed, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. So um, what I quickly learned uh, when I first started um, teaching short circuit is that um, you know a lot of it needs to be wrapped around context and and so um, you know speaking to some of the, the art we create in in short circuit uh, a lot of it is um, a lot of it is building stuff um, non digital stuff um, whether it's out of cardboard whether it's drawing whether it's it's basically taking these components and giving them life through this context we build um, and um, speaking to what Tony just said about like you know learning with the students I remember we we're doing we we're doing a sound output um, activity uh, last trimester of, of of short circuit and one of the students I was like well, look at this. We look at this thing we built. It can produce any kind of sound, and you know what kind of sound do you want to produce? And they're like fart noises. I'm like, oh right, of course. And so we made a fart machine. And you know, it's like rolling uh, with you know what the students want, and then like kind of figuring out and coming with a plan, and then just like changing it as as it uh, inside the class, you know, as it evolves. Nice. Ben, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think both uh, Syed and Tony got at something that's, that's kind of important, and it's, it's also echoing what SparkFun kind of does, which is you kind of teach some, some foundational concepts and try to get them uh, kind of getting a few simple things working, and then you kind of let them loose. You have to let them explore. You have to let them kind of... Uh, yeah, kind of tap into what they want to do. Um, and so typically in a SparkFun class, you know, we'll teach them how to solder for a little while until, you know, we feel like they've got soldering down. And then um, we'll kind of, you know, they'll, they'll typically be, be soldering up a kit, like a little Simon Says kit or a clock, a watch. Um, and then we kind of let them explore, like, what the Simon can do. You can actually kind of hack the Simon and make it um, respond to light or respond to sound or um, communicate with another Simon even. Uh, so this kind of two-part approach I think is, is really important. So you give them, you know, foundational knowledge and then, yeah, you have to let them loose because um, that's how they own it, I think. Awesome. Does anybody want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted um, to talk a little bit about some of the experiences we've had working with uh, teachers in the National Writing Project and getting them involved. And um, I, I think what's really, really cool about it is that it does shift uh, the dynamic in the classroom. And so you hear, um, you know, all these like fantastic uh, facilitators talking about how they, they leverage what the kids wanted to do in, in really unique ways. And so I, I think it is following their lead. Um, you know, it's just playing with the materials and saying, yeah, I don't know how to do that, but let's let's figure it out, right? You know, so I, I'm sure Saeed is never programmed for fart noises before, right? But, you know, you, you put two and two together, you try it out, sometimes it fails, um, and it becomes this, like, really beautiful process of co-construction um, that a lot of times teaching in the classroom is not that, you know, so we already, we have this this path of, of what we want to explore, of what we want to develop, and I think 
uh, short circuits physical computing is you're always kind of making do with what you have. Is you never had the right component, you don't want a special order something, you're always just looking for it. But it also means you're always solving a novel problem, so you're not going to know the answers. And so that can be really hard um, as, a, as a teacher or an instructor or a facilitator um, to kind of be uh, secure in that position. But it can, it, it's also really liberating for your teaching. You know, it doesn't mean you have to prep, you don't have to solve the problems, it just means you figure it out together. Great. And Donna, I'm wondering if you can also uh, quickly talk to us about differentiation in, in schools, just the differences in, in, in ages when you're, when you're teaching these children. Sure. Yeah, this is okay. something that's, like I said earlier, we have mostly 6th and 7th graders, but sometimes we have right. older students as well. And one, one way I found at least the differentiation is um, through the use <laughs> of um, materials that aren't necessarily related to the circuits that we're building um, and maybe the housing of the projects in other ways. So um, like Ariana said, she considers she considers herself an artist. She does a lot of drawing and um, all the students come with their different interests. So the one thing we can do is even if we're making a simple circuit, there might not many changes you can make to a circuit, especially if it's the first one you've ever built. Let's say you're building a one button controller like Syed did with them. They had one button controllers that looked like mice, they had ones that looked like bazookas that you put on your shoulder that were made out of large cardboard boxes. So the differentiation doesn't always come through the tech, but it comes through the creative expression of the students and the materials that you use to do the work. And this kind of also touches on, um, you know, what Ben was saying is kind of setting up that studio environment, right? You have the materials, whether they're electronic materials or arts and crafts materials, because you want to have everything on hand because you don't know what the students are going to bring to something like a one-button controller or a flashlight. You can have wild, wildly different ideas uh, come up, so you just want to always be prepared. And Don, what can we offer educators or mentors interested in teaching physical computing to, to younger people? Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I worked um, with others at IOP to put together a short circuit professional development course as well as a curriculum that's online. I would, um, and um, I believe you can share out that link with everyone. Um, it's blocked here at the school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's two large PDF documents. Each one's at about probably about 50 pages, and they include eight professional development um, kind of modules for educators and eight um, activity modules for students. And if you look at that, you'll notice there is a kind of disconnect between the two because, again, touching on what others have said earlier, it is set up really to be uh, a kind of studio environment. So if you start first as an educator and look through the professional development materials, you'll understand everything you need, which is basic inputs and outputs for um, on the Arduino and physical computing in general, whether it's simple soldering, circuits, LEDs, resistors, and then when you get to the student modules or the activities, they are a little bit more free, they're a little bit more open, and you'll see there's less tech there and kind of more creative um, opportunities available. And as I said, you won't notice a one-to-one, -one, but if you're an education, educator that doesn't have much experience with physical computing, look at the PD first, then look at the activities until you get a good idea of um, what you want to try. But if you already have a background in electronics, just going right to the activities would be a good idea because they can give you some um, quick ideas and material lists for what you might want to do if you have an hour or two hours after school with students. Awesome. And for those watching, those materials are actually available on, on the, the page that you're watching the video, and they're at the bottom. So just scroll to the bottom, and you should see a, a short circuit link, and just click that, and you'll have access to to all of that, all of those materials. So um, I want to move on and, and talk about um, all of these initiatives we've been discussing and what they actually look like and how they function. So first, uh, Tony and Syed, I'm wondering if, if you want to introduce or, or talk about what, it, what it's like being an instructor at Short Circuit and um, just share the photos and, and just visually walk us through a, a typical afternoon using the photos. Yeah, sure. Let me bring up our photos. And I definitely would say it's a tag team effort. Uh, we sort of, a lot of times Syed will introduce um, what we're doing in the basics, and then we both will jump in and be working with kids throughout the two hours. Okay. Here we go. Okay, do we have photos? Um, 
are these, can you guys see these? Yep. 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 Okay. All right. So um, here we have, these are, these were our one button controllers. Um, and so as you can see, this, this is a mouse shaped like a mouse. Um, we have this one, which is a giant cardboard box, lots of duct tape. This one was actually my favorite controller. Uh, it was it was a little it was totally not something I expected to see. What are we looking at exactly? Can you can you? Um, okay, yeah, sure. So um, it's it's a cardboard box, and inside it you've got basically the circuit. Um, and he's if you see Eli's got that um, he's got a piece of foil in his hand, and what you had to do is um, you have to basically. Um, push that piece of foil onto those two circle, circular pieces of foil that are sticking out of the box. Um, and so, like, when you connected those two pieces of foil, uh, your character, your little avatar, would jump on screen. So that one, you definitely had to be really involved and, like, slam that down every time your character wanted to jump. And so that was really fun playing with that one. Um, compared to this one's Kai's, and uh, you just, like, click that middle button. Uh, same setup, just a different... Um, case. And uh, let's see, I'll just like go through the rest of these and say it if you want to jump in anytime. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically uh, the idea of the activity was we had a game, um, a one button game called Cannonball made by Adam Saltzman. Um, and I had a little script that um, wrote, rewrote um, the space bar to a, a mouse. Uh, click button. So the, the previous pit of photos that you're seeing of, of the kids building um, those one button controllers, they were, um, <clears throat> they were, we had these arcade buttons where they basically just made these giant encasements and made their own arcade controllers. Um, and then there were also instances where they just had two points. They had two contact points uh, to complete um, a circuit. So, so when you, when you on, a momentary, on, on a momentary switch, when you press down on a button, um, it completes a circuit and sends uh, sends a signal to the computer. And so, basically, we gave them um, uh, a lot of cardboard, uh, a lot of duct tape, a tons of t uh, tin foil, and um, and let them have at it. And so, they created their own kind of momentary switches, um, as you saw, Eli's. And then the other photos that we're looking at is, are, are um, some of our motor activities. Um, and uh, we also made some sock puppet LEDs where if, you know, when, when, the, uh, when the sock puppet would uh, move its mouth, its, its, uh, its lights would light up. Um, uh, there was lots of glitter glue involved. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, was, so you could see there's lots of, there's a pretty crafty component to our program. And a lot of it is just taking really simple circuits and then and then just building stuff around um, around these uh, around these components. And Ariana, I'm sure you recognize a lot of these photos, and I'm wondering if you wanna if you wanna talk about maybe your your favorite project that you're seeing here. Maybe Tony can can take us back to to that to a specific photo. Yeah, let's see. I think there's one. Uh, these two yeah, right that here. One, that one, yeah. Oh, those okay. two pictures. Except my face looks super weird. Anyway, <laughs> that, um, that's okay. Yeah. Tell us, tell that's us what's going robot. on. That's um, That's that's Victor and I's uh, robot. And yeah, that's how, how did how robot. did you make it, Ariana? Um, how did you make it? Well, we used a motor, and um, we put together some pipe cleaners and. Legos to make a robot. I kind of twisted a few colors together to make it kind of unique, and it kind of moves like really slightly on the table. <laughs> Except it's really funny when it's in motion. It really is, <laughs> and all it does is kind of spin around and kind of move really slowly. But it kind of shudders while it moves. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you can see the motor and the little power source down on the ground underneath uh, Victor's it's elbow. It's sort gray. of it's gray. Yeah. Yeah, cool. that's the power source. And I right see there, that where the mouse is. Whoop. 
And I see that you're also working with someone, and I'm just curious whether a lot of your projects involve work or collaborating with, with other classmates, or, or is there a lot of independent work too? Well, it really depends on the project that we're doing, but for this particular one, we were supposed to do it with partners, if you wanted to, I guess. I don't remember, but um, we were supposed to just collaborate to make one robot. It didn't even take a week at all. It only took a few minutes, not minutes, but like maybe an hour. I'm not sure, but it definitely did not take a week. It's a really simple robot. It just shutters. That's it, pretty much. But it moves. Cool. So, so Tony, do you want to walk us through anything else, or, or tell us about um, maybe a day at short circuit, or, or what a typical afternoon is like? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going. Let me talk about these really quickly, um, and then I'll, I'll talk about what we usually do um, for our two hours. So. Um, these two kids are working on the same project as Ariana was over here with Victor. Um, and so we told them to make, you know, these like little creatures, little bugs that moved around. But um, a handful of the kids, maybe like about half of them, uh, they, instead of doing that, they sort of made these really cool propellers. So you can see they have them spinning around, which was something we like hadn't even thought of. Um, and so I think the next week they did another similar, we did some optical illusions because everybody was so into this like, propeller using the motors to create this spinning motion. Um, so definitely a lot of our, some of our lesson plans will come from their innovations like in the classroom. Um, so our usual uh, two hours, um, and Syed, if I'm like messing up, totally jump in, but we, we come in, we uh, have some free time with computers, uh, and a lot of times the kids are using Minecraft uh, sometimes they're playing music, and we'll have snack. And then after snack is when we get started on our projects. And it's usually, if it's a long project, we'll spend like the first half, oh, the first entire um, like Thursday afternoon working on part of the project, and then we'll finish it Friday afternoon. Um, if it's a shorter project, uh, usually they'll do the art stuff first, and then we'll put our circuits together at the end. Um, and every once in a while we have time at the very end of class for everybody to go around and um, show what they've made because we will get like such variety. Um, so here, this is our, one of our optical illusions. And here's just like, you know, a, our daily set of supplies. Yeah, what's, what's really interesting is that like we, I, I, I personally like um, reusing a lot of the components. Uh, one is it's you know it's cheaper that way, and then the other is that you can it's it's incredible that that like a battery and a motor can can be used in like an optical illusion uh, project, and it can also be used in like making propellers or a drawing machine, which um, I don't think there are photos on here, but there's photos of it on on our blog, um, which I could show. Now, if that makes sense, um, here I'll... yeah, I think we can we can transition okay. uh, to you, Syed, and um, what you're going to be showing us is um, your initiative, Baby Castles. Mm -hmm. So just just so our viewers know. <laughs> yeah. So and then, and then could you also talk about the experience in, in addition to to kind of describing the photos? Mm -hmm. um, just right before I get into Baby Castles, I wanted to show the the blog really quickly and I think I turned into the blog now yeah and um, and so this is this is our website um, and Ariana actually does a lot of the posts and the documentation um, this was some of the photos here um, are uh, drawings from a drawing machine we made uh, it was basically um, a piece of string a motor and a pen and uh, a little potentiometer, which is this like knob that kind of turns the um, uh, turns the motor up or down, and so they ended up making some really cool drawings from that. And we've also used um, we've also used the stuff that's not directly related to physical computing, um, like Scratch Two, um, uh, because it does uh, Scratch Two has like uh, sensors and it does uh, stuff that that's kind of like related to human-computer um, 
human computer interaction and so so we've we've made um, we made games where we did use uh, the video sensing in scratch 2 and the audio sensing and that's been very very cool um, and now I'm going to switch to um, my pictures of baby castles so if we turn that's my face and then we go over here all right and um, so yeah so this was this was um, this was one of our arcades at in Savannah uh, which was basically which was basically um, a one day workshop where we had a bunch of kids come in they created this uh, this arcade cabinet for this game called Get That Swag. Um, it was a local game from from a local developer, and so the developer and the kids worked together to to basically um, build a reset button and this uh, kiosk where um, you could basically put it up in in um, in. Uh, uh, in a space and and have people play it. Um, and we've di we've been doing that for a while now. So this is <laughs> this is Meowton, which was we basically <laughs> made a, a cat town in um, in uh, in Paris where you would crawl in and have to play uh, like a cat, and it, it was an exhibition of uh, of cat games. Um, and we also this was also kind of it. it a, a workshop, but mostly an installation. Um, this is uh, our arcade in uh, Pittsburgh, which was also um, uh, which was also uh, a workshop where we we brought game developers and asked them to um, asked them to um, uh, build cabinets and present their games, and we curated an exhibition. Um, another f photo of our Savannah uh, install, and then this is uh, in front of BAM. This is a, a few kids. Uh, we we're kind of doing this like game design uh, workshop where we were showing them different independent games, and this is a game of JS Joust. Um, and yeah, and then this last photo is of uh, an installation we did at the Museum of Natural History, which was basically um, basically this uh, planetarium game where. <clears throat> A bunch of people came um, into this dome, and uh, three or f three or more people had controls, and they had to collaborate to navigate uh, through this uh, asteroid field. And from what I can uh, tell, I think it was the first uh, game of its sort in a in a in a dome giant planetarium. So so that's kind of like whoa! I just made that spin. Um, that's kind of like the stuff that uh, uh, we've been doing in the past year or so. Awesome. And Ben, I know that you you also have some photos you want to share. So um, I'd love to I'd love to see them. And, and could you also uh, talk about what it's like teaching there at SparkFun? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me bring up my photos. Um, so at SparkFun, we really kind of teach everyone from from really young to really old. And and since we're focused on kids, I'll kind of keep it. Um, under 18 for, for now, but um, I'll just kind of run through a, a few of the things that we've done recently, and um, yeah, we'll go from there. Um, so this is Daphne. Um, she's actually the daughter of one of our employees, and um, I'm not sure how many of you out there have heard of Squishy Circuits. Um, this is Anne-Marie Thomas's creation. Um, basically, you create conductive and non-conductive Play-Doh, and you can create circuits from them. Uh, so we made up a batch for Daphne to play with, and um, she really liked it. So uh, we're, um, she, we can do all kinds of interesting things with this Play-Doh. So you can actually kind of create a variable resistor where the, the stretchiness of the Play-Doh is kind of... Um, related to the resistance of the circuit. So depending on what you hook up to this variable resistor, you can make a certain number of lights light up, you can change the sound on a piezo speaker, you can do all kinds of interesting things. And while Daphne may 
not exactly have, have been able to hook this up from scratch. She certainly understood the idea that if she stretched out the Play-Doh, she was changing the circuit. And she, she actually got pretty good at, at manipulating some of the wires to do uh, some of the things that she wants. And she's two years old. So um, the lower bound for this, I think, is something that, that should be really explored. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we went on a West Coast tour fairly recently. Um, some of you may know this young gentleman. Uh, his name's Quinn. He's kind of a rock star. Uh, he goes by the name of Q Techno, uh, and he's um, 11 years old, and he wanted us to come um, help him teach a class uh, over in his garage. So as part of the West Coast tour, we, um, we basically came to his house and sat back and mostly let him run the show. Um, he brought a bunch of his friends in, and we did basic intro to Arduino using the Spark Fun Inventors Kit, um, which is basically kind of like a a great um, structured way to kind of get an introduction to Arduino and what kind of circuits uh, you can, simple circuits that can hook up to motors or LEDs or um, you know light sensitive uh, photocells and um, a really good variety of different things that also gets into some of the basic programming. Um, and yeah, his friends seem to really like it and we got, we got all kinds of great feedback from them. Um, and we also went to the East Coast uh, and did uh, some soldering workshops there. So this is a young gentleman putting together uh, a weevil eye, which is um, it's a simple circuit board. It's only a few solders, but um, basically it has a little photo cell on there that when you cover it, these little red LEDs light up. Um, so you get this little kind of interactive creature. Um, I just love this shot because it's, I mean, he's so cute and he's reading the instructions and kind of um, really figuring out how to teach himself. So we're there as a support and certainly will help you troubleshoot, but um, a lot of the times we'll just give them the instructions and let them kind of walk through it at their own pace because um, before hovering over their shoulder then they feel pressured and um, you know they don't learn as much because we're, if we're, we're constantly interfering so um, most of them do just fine on their own you know we make sure that uh, they're using the soldering irons properly and they have their safety goggles on and that's about it. Um, this young lady just completed her Simon Says kit. So we have this nice little um, soldering kit that's it's great for um, beginning solderers. And uh, yeah, the great thing about it is you've learned how to solder and you get to take a little functional thing home and you can, you can actually play Simon on it. Uh, and if your friends have done it too, then you, you've got um, the potential there for um, interacting and kind of exploring uh, a new thing that you've created, right? And um, a lot of the kids really love the Simon. Uh, we put a special secret uh, disco mode in there, so if they play around with it um, and they got it working, sometimes we'll show them that. They get a real kick out of it. Um, this is uh, another young lady. She's uh, in the middle of the SparkFun Inventors kit, kind of using a, a soft potentiometer and um, you know, and just um, we get all sorts of nice pictures of these kids really having fun and engaging um, with the materials that we provide. Um, you know, we teach them how to solder. I've I've personally taught kids as young as four or five how to solder, and um, you know they can do it. And one of the things that Spark Fun does that that is hard to do with traditional education is um, take a few risks. Uh, so you know we we make sure that they're not um, going to hurt themselves too bad, but we'll also put a soldering iron in their hands um, and, and give them kind of the, the self-efficacy and the power to, to do something that, you know, is a little bit more dangerous than they'd be able to do in school. And, and most of the time that trust is, is felt by the, the kids and they reward us by, by being good and, and really engaging with it and treating it seriously, um, but also having a lot of fun at the same time. Um, this is a uh, intro to microcontrollers class that we taught at SparkFun. Um, we get all kinds of age ranges. A lot of uh, parents come in with their kids, um, so there's kind of like 
a nice bonding moment there uh, with families that come in and, um, you know, uh, parents that used to be engineers or are still engineers or not technical at all but want their kids to kind of be better than they were. They'll come in and um, have a nice kind of uh, shared learning experience with us and, and that's really nice to see. Uh, this is a plush bots class, so I'm doing some e-textiles. We basically give people the kits to make their own plush toys. Um, and so we, we do some sewing with conductive thread and we use the lily pad to kind of program up your own stuffed animal that is a little bit more interactive and, and technological than your average stuffed animal. So you can have a little pressure sensor or button in the paws that will maybe um, make some LEDs and the eyes light up or things like that. So um, we, we don't typically teach one, one thing. We try to um, spread it out quite a bit. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, our autonomous vehicle competition that we hold every year at Spark Fun. So basically, um, every year we have a lot of teams that have been working for, for a few months on an autonomous vehicle that should be able to successfully navigate around the Spark Fun building. Um, and yeah, it skews a little bit older, but we're trying to make a real push this year to get um, junior high and high school students involved um, in this event, because a lot of things like FIRST Robotics teams um, uh, should be able to compete in this quite successfully and we'll actually have a separate division today uh, this year for for younger participants, but um, I love Great. this shot. Oh, of, um, oh, ben, I'm sorry. I think I'm gonna have to cut you off for running out of time and we still yeah. need to, to get to some questions, but um, before we switch over to the Q&A portion, Kylie, could you please talk about the the Make to Learn contest for, or the, I guess the, the Make to Learn Use contest for students? Um, yeah. What it is, yeah, and, and how parents and educators and kids, they can all get involved. Great. Yeah, so um, uh, this year through the MacArthur Foundation, we're leading a um, thematic called Make to Learn. And part of our activities is, is to have uh, the Make to Learn contest for youth. And so we want to hear from, from uh, all of the youth that might be turning in today or from Quest to Learn or in short circuits. Um, and you're invited to upload, you know, it could be a simple picture or a video of what you've been doing and answer four short questions. And you could win uh, all sorts of different prizes ranging from iPads to uh, you know, these Dream Maker gift cards and, and so on. Uh, so, Ariana, I hope to see your submission in there um, at, at some point. So, um, just go to instructables.com and go to their contests and choose the Make to Learn contest, and it'll flow you through on how to get started. Great, thank you. And I will include that link uh, at the end of this, this episode. Uh, so, let's start uh, the Q&A portion. Um, the first question comes from John, and he asks, is it too late for adults to benefit from the same approach say, from a, a, for a professional development setting? Um, I, I, I wanted to speak to that really quickly. I, I, I think it's never, it's never too late, and that seems, sounds like a cliche, but when I, when I got into this, I, 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 uh, I came in as a student learning about physical computing at ITP, and then uh, teaching it has been an incredibly exciting experience, and the things I've learned, I really, really wish I learned when I was a lot younger. And especially in, uh, when I was doing my undergrad in computer science, it, it definitely uh, showed me how, you know, electronics, the, the, you know, how the basic components of, of what computers are and what electronics are and then how we interact with them. And I think those, that's a very important cultural um, uh, uh, thing to have. And so, so yeah, so I think it's, it's really exciting for, for people of all ages to get involved. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Sophia, and she, this question is for Ben, and she asks him, do you find that kids in your SparkFun workshops end up going beyond the kits and the direction booklet? Uh, absolutely. Um, so uh, if not during the workshop, then a lot of times after, um, we'll either get questions from them to our email because we're very free with that. And they'll, they'll say, so I took your class, you know, a couple weeks ago, and now I'm working on, like, this crazy robot design that I've always wanted to make, and now I feel like I can do it, and I'm stuck on this one part. Uh, can you guys help me out? And so 
uh, we'll try to do that as much as we can. Or um, we'll see a lot of of the kids that took you know a very an intro kind of basic class show up for our advanced classes later on, um, and so we get some kind of data that that they've kept on learning and are still interested. So yeah, it's really satisfying to see that. Awesome. And then our, our next question, and I think it's going to be our last question, is from Jennifer. And she asks, how many students are in the short circuit program? Is there an ideal number? Um, all right. So hopefully you can still hear me here. It's a bit loud. But um, at short circuit so far, uh, this year we've had about 12 students each um, trimester. And we find that to be a good number with about one or two facilitators. And it seems like a really, uh, you know, tight ratio, like a one to six ratio. But it all depends on the age of the students and um, really the types of work that you're doing. But as we've talked about it again and again, it is a studio style environment. You can have students using soldering irons. You can have people using tools that could potentially be harmful. You want to be able to keep a good watch on the students, um, still allow them to um, experiment. And that does take you know a considerable amount of staff or just control over the situation in general. So again, younger the students, I would say the more facilitators needed in a smaller group setting, but as you have people that are older um, or that can be trusted more potentially dangerous things, then I think you can open it up a little. But really, it's just about finding the balance between allowing freedom but still having a safe environment for everyone to be able to really express themselves. Great. Thank you, Don. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We are out of time, unfortunately. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be posting um, a response in the comment section at the bottom of this page early next week. So be sure to check back. Um, uh, if you scroll to the bottom of this page, you'll find a link to our short circuit guides. Um, and you can there's a, a PDF that you can download to help you kickstart your own DIY and, and hacking studio. Join us for the next episode of Playtime Online, March 20th, to learn about SimCity EDU. This is a brand new community for teachers to create and share SimCity, SimCity based lessons. Um, we'll be looking at lesson plan examples and unveiling a fun surprise for our viewers, so make sure to, to tune in for that. For updates on Playtime Online, sign up for our mailing list. Just click the Join Us at the top of this page. Thanks for watching, everyone. And if you like what we're doing, please spread the word. Have a great afternoon. Bye, guys.